Now hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Uh, good morning, Soldier, and peace be with you. Uh, it's good to see you all. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, my name's Jonah. I'm one of the pastors here at Sojourn. Uh, thanks for coming and being with us. Our, our mission as a church, the reason that we exist is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus, the good news of who he is and what he's done, uh, see them built up as his church so that they can follow him as we send them out into his world. And so that's what we do here. It looks all kinds of different ways. We do all kinds of different things, but I'm thankful you're here this morning. Um, in a couple of weeks, we have Trunk or Treat coming up, which is kind of like a big neighborhood party we throw, trying to have a safe spot for Halloween. If you'd like to participate in that, you can check out the welcome table. Talked about it a little bit last week. You can sign up for a trunk. Uh, there's all kinds of other ways to serve. If you're kind of anti-candy, for whatever reason, uh, there's other things you can do other than hand out candy at trunks. So you can check that out. And we also have new swaggy hats. Um, Huh? Now first, for my bald people out there, I see a couple of you, I see you. Um, Y'all don't know what it's like when the temperature turns like this and you got no hair. Um, so always open to a nice hat. Uh, for those who've been at Sojourn for a little while, y'all remember the bumper stickers that we had at the 930? Remember that? It's a little throwback. The Helvetica Noi font with the period at the end. Don't worry, we used to be real into fonts. Uh, so it's kind of a throwback for those of us who've been a while. And I think this is a fundraiser for something student ministry related. You know how students are always trying to raise money for camp while, <laughs> while the family pastor drives a 20-year-old car with 200,000 miles on it, you know? It just doesn't look right. Um, you got that right. That was a joke. People are always like, you know those church people and their extravagant lifestyles. Um, so, anyway, uh, buy a hat. It's comfortable. feels good. I've been wearing it all morning. feels great. I encourage you to do it. Uh, so in a, in a couple of days, um, I turned 40. No big deal. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's just like solidly middle-aged. I don't have any feeling, like, I don't have any real strong feelings about it one way or the other. I'm not like, oh, my gosh, 40. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really, it's just another day. When, when you're kind of a middle-aged man and you got kids and jobs and stuff, it's like, it's another day, you know? Like, what are you doing for your birthday? I'm like... I'm going to go to work and take my kids to school and do homework and, you know, it's just another day. So it's not like, a, I don't know, not worried about 40. So don't come up and be like, you know, 40 is the new 30 or I don't care about any of that stuff. Um, it's just, you know, you think about life by based on the charts, you know, I'm more than halfway through my, the time allotted to me if I make it to fully cooked, you know, um, if I hit life expectancy for U.S., American men, uh, more, more than halfway done. And so I've just been thinking about it a little bit. And uh, one of the weird kind of tangents my mind went on um, a couple of weeks ago when I was thinking about turning 40 was that, um, you know, it wasn't until my mid 30s that I realized life was painful. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, like in my mid 30s, I also learned that randomly I will wake up and sleep wrong and my neck will hurt for two months or something like that. That didn't happen to me until my 30s. But I don't, so I don't mean the kind of pain like where stuff hurts or like a hard job. Um, you know, not the kind of pain that leaves calluses on your hands as much as like the pain that leaves calluses on your soul. You know the difference? Um, so the difference between like life is painful. I always knew life was hard. I'd had a lot of hard jobs in my 20s. Uh, seminary was hard. But painful was a, a, a new unexpected concept for me, I guess. And that's where things don't work the way that you expect them to, or, or things don't turn out the way that maybe you would expect them to. Um, you know, there, there, was a time, uh, there was a time in our church, in this church, where we had buried more babies than we had buried adults, um, which there's, you know, on a positive side of that, like we were a young church um, with lots of kids and 
uh, growing and you know so there's this, a way you could look at that as a happy thing but like when you're preparing to give your funerals you want to give funerals of like saints who died well and you can honor their lives and not not little not little caskets and um, that was disorienting and uh, it was painful there have been long stretches of life in our church that's just filled with suffering and surprises which isn't to say only suffering, but it's just been frankly shocking how painful and difficult life can be. Uh, and you know, I'm, you don't have to answer, obviously, but just curious how old you were when you realized life could be painful like that. Um, makes you tired in your soul, in your bones, the kind of tired that a nap doesn't fix. Um, and you don't have to answer this one either, but uh, have you realized Christianity can be that way yet? Um, do you remember how old you were when you realized that the church was run by people? Y'all, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that, you know, people tend to do what people tend to do. Uh, boy, that's been difficult for me. Um, every one of my heroes. In, in my 20s, all the people that I paid to to read their books or to go to their conferences have been fired, uh, become alcoholics, have committed suicide, have cheated on their wives. Um, there's one guy holding on and he's past his life expectancy with pancreatic cancer right now. You know, there's like one guy in his 70s that I'm like, please die before the, the mess comes out or something, you know? Like, so I get it. I get that feeling of like, I think we're calling it deconstruction now, you know? Um, the church isn't what I thought it would be, and it's become so painful. Uh, I get that pain. And, uh, you know, with the deconstruction crowd, when they're faced with that pain and the disappointment of what churches can be like, I really thought our church was going to be like a revival church where we came and preached the gospel. In your 20s in the church planting world, you say things like, nobody preaches the gospel in that town, which is nonsense in America. Um, but that's what we say, and so we're going to go save the town. And, um, you know, really our church has turned out to be a, a church for hurting people. And um, it seems to me that when you've, when you get hurt by the church, uh, have you noticed how often people um, maybe make it through the first round of church hurt, but then the second round of church hurt, what do people usually end up doing? Anybody have seen it? Where do they go to church five years after that? Just kind of don't anymore. And you get it, right? I get it. Um, you ever met, I don't know, uh, met somebody that in the pain of life, uh, they just decide they're not going to do this anymore, whatever the this that caused them pain. You know, that first marriage was so bad, I'm just never going to trust somebody again. Um, my dad was so terrible, I'm never going to trust men again. Um, that job was so terrible, I'm never going to work in that industry again. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make here is that the experiences themselves, whatever it is that maybe you're thinking of right now, those are painful enough. That experience, whatever it is, is and unbelievably painful. But if we don't know what to do with the pain, or if as life tends to go, the pain gets multiplied and you go through something similar again, the, when that builds up, the long-term effects of this kind of fatigue is so often just to withdraw and say, I'm not gonna do this anymore, whatever, whatever the this is. That's what it is for me. And it gets really confusing because for me, my professional life, my spiritual life, my personal life is all just my life. You know, there are people are like, what do you do when you get off of work? And I'm like, I don't do this get off of work thing. Because when do I, when am I not a Christian? You know what I mean? Is it four o'clock? It's like, I'm not a Christian anymore. Sorry about your situation. You know what I'm saying? And so it gets, it gets blurry. And there's times where the pain is just so surprising and unexpected and overwhelming that a voice tells me, just stop it. And I don't know what it is sometimes. It feels like this. And I don't, don't raise your hand again, but maybe if you want to, make me not feel so alone. Have you been a Christian long enough that you've tried at least once to stop being a Christian? You know what I'm saying? Where you're like, I just don't, I just don't want to do this anymore. Whatever the this is. And it, it's piling up and it's, it's too much. Um, now, personally, I find a lot of comfort in being able to say things like that out loud. Uh, because I think those are very biblical things to say. Uh, biblical, not in the sense of, uh, that God is like, you should say that. That's a great thing for someone to say, as much as the Bible is filled with people who say things like that. And somehow God in his wisdom 
when he sought to preserve his word and communicate something to us, he kept in their stories of people who said the wrong thing and believed the wrong thing and, and did the wrong thing. And I think in a lot of ways, these are the thoughts of the Hebrews congregation. Because as we journey through Hebrews, this is the first time that we get a really stark warning in Hebrews chapter 2. And you'll see this pattern emerge in the book of Hebrews where there'll be high praise, like the music hits and everybody all of a sudden is in, into it. You know, like when your song hits at the concert and all of a sudden you forget about your troubles and you forget about what's going on and you're focused on something wonderful. And then he stops all of a sudden. He, he ends the song and then he goes back to preaching real quick. So you'll see these high exaltations and then these warnings about how this should show up in the way that we live. And so he says in verse 1, we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. Notice how he says drift away and not, uh, I've heard it said before that, you know, the big sin is never the result of a bad night. You know what I mean? People don't just stumble like in a moment to this thing. It tends to be just this slow falling asleep behind the wheel and then all of a sudden you wake up in the ditch after drifting and drifting and drifting. Listen carefully to the truth or we may drift away from it. And did you notice how he connects truth and life here? The scriptures paint a world where what you believe matters for the way you live and the way you live is a reflection of what you believe. Uh, we can't separate those two, or we've said it here for a long time. Um, all of our theology, what we believe about God, is practical. And all of our practice is theological, meaning the way we live reveals something about what we actually believe. What you believe directly shapes how you live. And the preacher of Hebrews is saying, if you don't listen very carefully to what's true, you may find yourself drifting down the road of, fatigue-formed failure or pain-fueled abandonment. I don't know how you want to think about it. Um, and there's a lot of voices to listen to out there. Amen? In your pocket, you have access to a few billion voices and a few billion op opinions. You can watch somebody talking on YouTube about anything. And whose voice are you going to listen to? So when there is this invitation here, this warning, it's stronger than an invitation, to listen carefully, we need to answer the question, well, listen to who? And what does that mean? And in these four verses of Hebrews, he gives us three pictures or three examples of what we listen to, that we might hold on to this life of faith, that we might not drift away, we might not give in to the temptation to just be done with all of it. And the first the first place we listen to, or the first warning, I guess, is it's just, honestly, it's a bit sobering. So verse 2, the message God delivered through angels, angels just means messengers, if you didn't know that. The message God delivered through angels has always stood firm. Listen, every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So on a, on a positive side, uh, let's be thankful that God doesn't change. Um, that God's person doesn't change, his message doesn't change, and his promises don't change. He's not sending one angel to say one thing and another angel to say another thing, which if you wrestle with the chaos of the world like I do, it's good to be reminded that God does not change, and his promises do not change, his word does not change, he is stable and steady and consistent, which also means now on a little bit of the sober, scary side, every time God's laws have been broken, people have been punished. They have felt the consequences of their sin. Now, there is a sense in which uh, throughout history, has God actively punished somebody committing a sin? Meaning, has God done something? Yes. Um, that's a little bit, uh, well, you can have a conversation about that now in light of God's punishment being poured out and fully absorbed on the cross by Jesus. And so there's, there's a different kind of uh, punishment for sin. You might call it the passive punishment for sin, which is so often in life, the punishment of sin, the consequences of sin are wrapped up in the sin itself. So meaning, like for a lot of my life, man, like if I got a flat tire, I'd be like, oh, I didn't read the Bible this morning and God sent a lightning bolt to my tire. And that's, 
You know what I'm saying? Or like, if I had prayed longer this morning, I wouldn't have hit that nail on the road driving to seminary. I remember having that kind of stuff happen, driving out Grinstead Road or something and be like, oh my gosh, another, there was a week where I got like three flat tires in two weeks. And I was like, what is the sin? Was it my sin or my father's sin that caused me to get this? You know, that, that kind of idea. But so often the punishment for sin is wrapped up in the sin itself. And so come, let us reason together, Christian. Uh, the, the, I'll just warn you, the first service failed miserably at this next question. Does anybody know the ninth commandment? What is the ninth commandment? Number nine out of ten. Yes, thank you. Erin Warmbier. Hey, let's make sure we get her a gold star afterwards. Put her name up with the check plus. Um, uh, yeah, uh, in, in the words of King James, thou shalt not bear false witness. Um, which does include lying, saying things untrue about your neighbor. Uh, for me, I receive that as to stop exaggerating. That's kind of my, that's the way I break the ninth commandment. I tend to exaggerate. And that'll be things like, how was that hamburger? And I'll be like, oh my gosh, it will change your life. It was the best ever. You know, that's like, <laughs> it won't, man. You know, like, it's, just, it's just a hamburger. Uh, but that, so it could mean saying something not true, you know, like just lying. Or it could mean like, Everybody thinks that about her. And it's like, oh, I mean, you think that about her? Because everybody doesn't think that. You know what I'm saying? So when you lie, which y'all, everyone here's lied, amen? If you didn't amen, you just lied. So now, you know. <laughs> when we lie, uh, well, I don't want to ask that question yet. Um, what do you think will happen to your relationships if you lie regularly over the span of five years? Will you have more friends or less friends? Less friends. If you are a liar, you will find yourself isolated and lonely. Is that because God has struck you down with isolation and, and lonelyism? Um, no. If you lie, people don't trust you. And if they don't trust you, you won't be in a relationship with them. The punishment for lying is wrapped up in lying. If you're a liar, people won't be around you because you're a liar. And I can't trust you. I don't know what you're going to say. Um, is a car accident God's punishment for drunk driving? Do, when you're drunk, well, when someone is drunk, right? Because we don't do that here. Um, that was such a Christian joke because Christians, <laughs> Christians be drinking. Um, when, when someone is drunk, do they tend to make better decisions or worse decisions? Worse decisions. Why? Because when you're drunk, you're dumb. When you're drunk, you make dumb decisions. So when you get in the car drunk and you run into the mailbox, is that like, did God send you the demon of turning the steering wheel? It's like, no. That's why God says, don't be given to much wine. Don't be a drunkard. Why? Because if you do that, I mean, so often the rules against sin are because if you sin, life will go poorly for you. Why did God put not lying in the top 10 list? Because if you lie, it will ruin your life. Is if, you, if you're living for stuff, I want more money and more materialism and nicer stuff, is the punishment for that anxiety and isolation. No, God doesn't send you with an anxiety disorder. If you live for your stuff, you will find that you are terrified of losing your stuff. So what will you do? You will hoard it and you'll become anxious. Do I need to give any more examples? You see what I'm saying? The punishment for sin is so often wrapped up in the sin itself. The consequences of sin are embedded in the sin. And because God has designed a consistent universe, an ordered universe, no one is exempt from the consequences of sin. Here's, look at verse 3. What makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself? So stay with the warning here for a second. What makes you think you're the exception? Any of you had a friend that was convinced they could drive well when they were drunk? I mean, you ever had a friend, uh, how maybe this is, I don't know if this is too real or not, but like, you know, you don't have to raise your hand now, but you know anybody who's committed adultery? You know anybody who five years after the affair was like, man, that worked. <laughs> Do you know? I was lonely and frustrated in my marriage. I was mad at my kids all the time. So I had an affair. And then we got a divorce. And now my life is so much better. No. And yet, people have affairs 
all the time because they think that they will be the one to get away with it. What makes you think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation? God's laws have always been punished whenever they've been broken. There are no exceptions to the rule. The preacher is reminding us that fatigue and pain and difficulty can be so disorienting that bad things start to look good. I've known way too many people who've committed adultery and not one of them, um, not one of them said, you know what, pastor, I'm really looking to blow my life up right now. That, that's not what they're trying to do. They're saying, I'm lonely, I'm in pain, it's not working, this is so disappointing and it's so painful, it's so difficult that something so horrific is starting to sound pretty good. But remember, no one gets away with it. Every act of disobedience, every instance of not listening bears consequences. So hold on and listen well. A great salvation has been announced to you by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, which means that God's punishment for sin has been absorbed by Christ. He offers to set each one of us free through his invitation to come home. We don't have to fear the consequences of our sin anymore. We can listen well. We can hold on to this life of faith. So the first voice that we listen to to hold on to combat the temptations that come with suffering and pain is the voice of history, where we look and see what has God done in the past, what has he said in the past, and how have I seen this play out in the past? Our Catholic brothers and sisters have a long, long practice called aversion meditation. Some of you are thinking about doing something that you, you suspect might be a bad idea. And so aversion meditation would be meditate on people who have done the same thing and see how that's worked out for them. Or think about all of the consequences that will come from doing this and let that be a bit of an inspiration to move away from it. Think about how badly this will go. No sin goes unpunished. Listen to the voice of history. And then second, in the present tense, we can listen to the testimony of many witnesses. Verse three through four, this message that was then delivered to us by those who heard him speak. And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles. So there was this great testimony of history. And then as salvation was being announced, there were people whose lives were being changed. Miracles, good news, people were different. Pain and suffering plug the ears. You know this? Have, have you felt the kind of pain that makes it hard to hear anything? Hard to hear anything good, true, or beautiful? It can become hard to see God in the past. It can be hard to hear him in the present. So we have to hold on and learn to listen well. Some, again, some will refuse and do what seems right to them. One of the ways we can learn to listen in the present is by reflecting on how it's gone for the people that have done the thing that we feel tempted to do. Another, one of the best questions I've ever learned to ask, and I was, it was at a friend's wedding the night before, a bunch of us were sitting around a table, and one of the groomsmen asked the groom, he said to him, where have you seen evidence of God's grace in your life? And then it just turned into four or five hours of guys telling stories about how the Lord has shown up in our lives. Because uh, have you noticed when, and I don't know if, I don't know if you're on the merry-go-round of suffering right now, or if you just got off it, or you're about to get on it. I'm going to tell you, everybody gets a turn. Everybody gets a turn at life being hard and painful and surprising and unexpected. And when you are on that wheel, it can be nearly impossible to believe that anything good can happen to you that God has anything positive to say to you. And if we can become a people who learn to ask other people, how has he shown up for you that can help open our ears again to, to hear it and to see it? And it, listen, especially if you're, if you're solid middle-aged like me, you know, you're hitting those 40s and you got the kids and the responsibilities and all this stuff is happening. Find somebody with gray hair and ask them, where have you seen evidence of God's grace in your life. I'll, let me, I'll just give you one relatively recent example. Um, do you guys, rem you guys remember Chuck Hickey? Anybody remember Chuck Hickey? Um, Chuck is one of our, man, I'm gonna start crying again. Um, there's been a lot of crying in my life lately. Uh, Chuck Hickey Sr. was one of our recently departed saints. He died Christmas last year. Um, 
just a giant of a man uh, in terms of his faith and his effect, his presence in our church. If you didn't know Chuck personally, he had a really tough life. Uh, the first 40, 50 years of his life, a lot of pain, really tough life. And I was fortunate to be in a, a community group with Chuck for several years. We were in, he was in my house a lot, and uh, we were sitting in the basement one time, my basement, and um, I was just feeling profoundly discouraged and overwhelmed, and in one of those, like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, whatever the this is. And uh, I couldn't really, I didn't really know how to talk even. Like, I was just, I didn't know the words to say what I was trying to say. So I think I said something real theological to Chuck, like, what do you think about Jesus, Chuck? Um, I didn't know how to say it, you know? I, I wanted to know how he made it, you know? Like, how are you like this in light of everything that you've, you've been through? And so I said to him, like, what do you think of Jesus, Chuck? And instantly, he teared up. And you know when someone can't talk because they, they know their voice will break? And he started going like this. He started, you know, tears coming down his cheeks. And all he could manage to say, he just said, he's been so good to me. That's all he could say. He's been so good to me. And I just saw something on his face. And, and Chuck's faith in that moment fueled my faith in that moment. I, I needed the testimony of a witness, and I needed to believe that God still cared for me, that he would be good, that he would carry me. And I asked a ridiculous, simple question. Chuck gave me just a couple of words. But in that moment, it helped me to hold on. Hold on and listen well to the testimony of history. Listen well to the testimony of your brothers and sisters. And then finally, hold on and listen to the testimony of the Holy Spirit himself. Verse 4. God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. So there's a promise in the Christian life that the Holy Spirit will do something particularly to each one of us. Will we'll give us certain gifts, will equip us for certain things, and will even speak to us in certain ways. And, you know, maybe you're hearing, like, did they just say that the Holy Spirit is going to talk to me? That sounds mystical and weird. Um, I would say, yes, I did say the Holy Spirit will talk to you. Yes, it is mystical. Yes, it is weird. Um, not as weird as you might think. So, let, again, let's reason together. Let's put some of this together, what the, the preacher in Hebrews is talking about. So, if, if you want to understand, if you want to listen well to God's history, the story of what God has done and what he's promised to do. Where is the best place, the primary source, the first place we would look to find the history of God? Where is it? Somebody say it. The Bible. I don't know who said it, but somebody said it over there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Linda Stepp, ladies and gentlemen. It makes sense that you would say, you're a Bible lady. You know the Bible. You're, you're great at this. Um, the Bible. Uh, I don't know if you know this. One of the things, I'm not from here. I've been here for like more than a decade now, but people still remind me I'm not from here. Strangers remind me. They'll show up and be like, where are you from? You're not from here. Um, so one of the things that's been interesting about living here for me is uh, what people think about the Bible. And I don't know if you know this, but um, the Bible is primarily a storybook. 63% uh, of the Bible is stories, poems, and songs. So the first thing the Bible is is a history book. The second thing it is, is like it's poems and songs. Um, some of you have been told that the Bible is a rule book. Uh, and if you feel that way, just listen. It's not a rule book. Are there rules in it? Yeah, for sure. If God wanted to give us a rule book, he would have, he would have saved the trees, right? He wouldn't have gone through the waste of all the paper. He could have given us one little not even a pamphlet, a little card with the top 10 on it. You know, 10 rules, do this, and you're in. Keep these, you'll be fine. But instead, we have all of these stories, all of these songs. Some of you have spent a lifetime reading the Bible out of fear and duty. Um, and I would just beg you to stop it. And if that means literally don't read the Bible for a while, then don't read the Bible for a while. But if the only reason you're reading the Bible is because you feel guilty and afraid, you are going to miss what the Bible is about and what God wants to say to you in it. And I just, what might shift in you if you could see the Bible as a beautiful history of God's promise keeping? 
what, what if you saw it as a collection of goodness meant to revive your soul and encourage your spirit? If it was a story of how God's shown up for people like you in situations like yours and what he did then that might help you to believe he could do something good and true and beautiful in your life now. Part of listening well means learning to love the Bible as God's history of keeping his promises. And, and so we, we come to the Bible to be nourished, to enjoy, to feast, to be refreshed, to be encouraged, not to please God or... You know, for most of church history, people couldn't even read. And he, did anybody go to Harvest Homecoming over the weekend? Anybody hit that up? Uh, this is the world that we live in. At Harvest Homecoming, they're handing out Bibles. Did you see that? Like, our brothers and sisters at Sojourn East raised fifty or sixty thousand dollars a couple of years ago to buy to send Bibles to a country that doesn't have any Bibles. And they've got videos of people rejoicing, dancing in the streets because finally they have Bibles. We can all read, and they're like. They're so abundant here, they're giving Bibles away at our little town festival. It's unbelievable the opportunity that we have to learn to love this book. Part of listening well means learning to love the Bible as God's history of keeping his promises. So that's where we begin. Maybe you need to get into Bible fellowship. For most of human history, people learned how to read the Bible together as a group, not me in my prayer closet. And so you can do that. Make, you know, Sunday belongs to the Lord and pick a time and go learn to read the Bible. Then, where do we go to hear the testimony from witnesses of the power of God? Who do we know that knows something about God? If you were inclined to ask somebody for a story about how God's shown up for them, where might you go to find somebody you could talk to? What did I say? Church. Church. You made it. You're here now, you know, right here. You're surrounded by people with all that we've been through in the last three years that are still trying to say, I'm still trying to hold on and figure this thing out. We, we come into the presence of other Christians and, and what might happen if we stopped seeing the church as something to consume, to evaluate and critique, and rather saw it as a community to participate in? How do I know if I see it as something to consume? If you find yourself after a service being like, you know, the music didn't really do it for me today. Yeah, me neither, you know? Uh, uh, you know, the, I didn't really get fed by the preaching today. Um, I really like the small groups there better, but I really like the student ministry there better. And so I have my checklist where I give my grades for everything at the church, and we just, we treat the Church of Christ like a Walmart, where we come to get what we want. And then what happens when you don't get what you want? I would like to speak to the manager, you know? You get mad and fussy, and then what do you do? You leave. And you go to the next church, and boy, the music was great, and the preaching was great, and the kids is okay, and, you know, but the small groups are great, and then, oh, did you hear what they said in the sermon? And, oh, man, that song, and what, how, uh, can I speak to the manager? And you do that for two or three times, and then you find yourself, ah, just, but what if we were a community to participate in? Well, what if we came to church looking to give, to share, to serve, to knit our hearts with one another, knowing that, you know what, preachers are going to preach dumb stuff, and we're going to sing songs you don't like, and we're going to make mistakes, and there's going to be things that happen that we wish wouldn't happen, and we'll do our best to try differently, but we will be a family. You know, that's one of the primary images of the church in the Bible, a family. What if we were a family? So in this world that I'm painting in my mind were people who are studying the scriptures and hearing stories from our brothers and sisters about God and what he's up to. And over time, as we're studying the scriptures and hearing stories about what God has done in other people's lives, our minds being trained to recognize the kinds of things God does. We learn to recognize the voice of God. And here's an example. Do you know that God does not speak to you in words of condemnation? So when you didn't read the Bible yesterday and you're like, oh, I'm such a terrible Christian, I'm a failure, that is not God speaking to you. But you don't know that if you don't know the scriptures and you're not talking to other Christians. So over time, we love the scriptures and we learn to talk to one another and be curious and listen well. We learn to recognize the spirit of God speaking to us. And there'll come a time where you'll feel a little nudge. You'll feel a little push and be like, I don't know, should I do that or should I not do that? Sometimes it'll be really obvious. Sometimes it won't be. Sometimes you'll get the sense like, I think I should quit my job. Is that the kind of thing that God would tell someone to do? I've seen him do it before. 
It's not totally crazy. It's not like the guy that one time that told me he wanted to, uh, God told him to leave his wife so he could start a bus ministry. Pretty sure he didn't do that, man. Pretty sure God doesn't tell you to abandon your wife and your children so that you can start a ministry to other people's kids. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so is this the kind of thing God would tell us to do? And if it is, and you're still not sure, what should you do? I'm going to go look in the Bible and see if God has done something like this before. Well, he's, he has. I'm going to go talk to some friends and see what they think about this. And over time, we become a people who learn how to discern the voice of the Spirit speaking right to us. If you listen to the voice of history and the testimony of God's people, you'll learn to hear the voice of the Spirit speaking just to you day in and day out. And when this becomes our way of life, we'll be a people who hold on and listen well. Hold on so you can flip that. Listen well so you can hold on. Uh, listen well so you can hold on. Beautiful in its simplicity. Powerful in its profundity. At some point, likely very soon, it will be your turn. It will be your turn for pain. It will be your turn for suffering. It will be your turn for hardship. Will you be someone who knows how to hold on because you've learned to listen well? Or will you drift away? Listen very carefully to the truth you've heard, or you may just drift away. And so we come to the place where God's history, his testimony, and his spirit's voice speak in unison. We see it clearly and consistently, and we're invited to consume, to participate in it week in and week out. And this is when we call our minds to the night that Jesus was betrayed. This is the center of our faith, the center of what we're doing. He said to his disciples after he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, he thanked God for it, and he broke this bread. He's like, you know what it is, guys? What I want you to think about? If you're trying to figure out all this about me, this is like the dustiest, loafiest bread uh, I felt like LeBron James in the first service. You know when he throws up his chalk? I did that, and it was like just all over. My wife had to wipe me off afterwards, um, which I think is so funny. Like, this is such a big deal, you guys. This is the center of our faith. And how does Jesus say, you know what I want you to hold on to? If you want to know what this is really like, take the most normal thing in your life, bread. And if you want to know what I'm like, and if you want to know what this life is like, it's something like this. I am broken for you. Feast on me. Remember what I've done for you. And if you're confused about what God is like, how he feels about you, take his body given for you. Eat in remembrance of him. In the same way, when the meal was over, he took a cup of wine. He said, you know what your new relationship with God is like? It's like this. It's like this cup of wine, which maybe you're, you know, like weirded out by wine. This was just the most normal of drinks in Jesus' day. It's what they drank at every meal sitting on their table. He said, you know what it's like if you're worried, if you're anxious, if you're guilty, if you wonder if you're too far gone? Your new relationship with God, it's like this cup of wine sealed with the shedding of my blood. Drink this and remember what I've done for you. So that every time we eat or drink, we do so in such a way that reminds us what God thinks of us what he feels for us, what he's promised to do for us. He's given his body for us. He's sealed us in his family by his blood so we can hold on.